Inner Quest explores various pathways through which you can connect with the infinite wisdom of the universe and apply it to personal, professional, and spiritual growth. This program, featuring accomplished practitioners, educators, and authors, is provided by Infinity Foundation, an innovative center for holistic studies and research. We invite you to share this journey with us. Hello, welcome to InterQuest. My name is Jay Stone, your host for today, and our guest is Dr. Elizabeth Ann Stewart. Welcome, Dr. Stewart. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. Well, it's good to see you again. I think it was about eight years ago that I interviewed you? Around about 2004. Okay. And uh, is it okay if I call you Elizabeth again? Absolutely. Well, let me tell the audience a little bit about your vast work and interests. Uh, Dr. Stewart is an author, college professor, and spiritual guide who also happens to be a professional photographer. In Love with Words, she has published three collections of poetry several collections of scripture, reflections, children's fiction books on imagery and healing and theological works captivated by images. Uh, Dr. Stewart enjoys travel photography and photo photographing the natural world. She also does professional headshots, family portraits, children's photography, pet photography, weddings and events big and small. So uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, contemplative uh, photography. What is contemplative photography? Uh, let's begin with the word contemplation, um, or contemplative for that matter. A contemplative is somebody who focuses on the inner world, um, is very mindful in terms of how he, she lives life, the choices that person makes, um, tries to slow down. Um, the irony is that I multitask, do 101 things all the time, and yet somehow I have a contemplative core, which is where my, my whole interest in spirituality comes well, from. Well, I, I would assume that you break for the, from the 101 tasks to reflect and go inwards and contemplate. Exactly, and so photography helps me do that, and it's one of the tools by which I actually uh, go inwards and capture the inward. And so I do that with my writing, I do that with spiritual guidance, I do that with all kinds of workshops, healing and so forth. But photography is yet one other avenue. I can do it with cooking and gardening. But Now did you coin the phrase contemplative photography? Um, I don't think I did. I haven't heard many other people use it. But certainly contemplative photography is, is my kind of photography. I'm not interested in doing mass market photog uh, photography. I'm not interested in um, the kind of photography that creates a lot of stress. I, I, I like doing those things which engage me. And uh, how many years ago did you get started with photography? Was it something you did as a child? Um, I had a camera as a child, a little brownie, which I just took little family shots with. So I wasn't really a photographer then and um, never saw myself becoming a photographer. What changed was in the 90s I began leading pilgrimages abroad. And when, when I was at DePaul at that time and must have taken about 10 groups of students overseas to different countries, you know, ranging from Tunisia to Spain to Malta, Italy. And, and were you visiting like uh, religious and spiritual, cultural places and museums? Yes, mostly. Uh, a lot of um, archaeological sites as well as worship spaces. And so the students would be engaged in study and at the same time personal reflection. And at that time, I, I invested in a really good camera and began taking shots, which I then exhibited and began selling and suddenly discovered I was a photographer um, mm -hmm. and enjoyed it immensely. Mm -hmm. And uh, while you're traveling, were you also journaling? No, it was almost as though the imagery with photography took the place of words. So um, I've gone from writing explicit poetry, you know, some of my books, Woman Dreamer, for example, that was my last book of poetry, um, there are two books of poetry reflected in this one volume, Leaning Into Light, um, but I haven't produced a volume of poetry since. 
uh, I've done some reflection um, in terms of scripture. This book was the last one I did, A Pocket Full of Sundays. Um, but basically, I think that a lot of my personal reflection is now captured through imagery as opposed to and digital imagery as opposed to through words. Now, I've interviewed uh, uh, a few guests who uh, teach journaling, teach journaling for infinity, and they encourage people to go back and read their journals from 5, 10, 20 years ago. Do you ever go back and look at your photos, photos that you took 10, 15 years ago and see how your photography has changed uh, over the years? Um, I don't go back so much to see how my photography has changed, but more to see, to recapture the moment of that initial encounter with the image. Um, for example, if we could look at um, an image of a palm tree, perhaps, if that comes to, I have a, a photograph of a palm tree, which I'm hoping we can look at. Uh, yeah, she's cueing the, uh, our director. All right, there we go. Um, now, you might say, well, it's just a tree. What is there to go back to? But I can remember precisely seeing that image and the light that hit the tree and the intensity of color in the, in the dates. And uh, just looking up, um, that tree was really you know, towering over me in a botanical garden in Malta, which is where I'm from. And, and so I can go back to that image and relive that experience, recapture the immediacy of it. Now, we're multi-sensory, so did the sense of smell come back to you? Maybe the sense of sound, if you were hearing birds, uh, perhaps the palm tree emitted a certain fragrance. Did the other senses come back to you, the, the feeling? Yes, very often, depending yeah. on the image. Um, the color, the intensity, the sound, it's almost as though with a photograph, uh, um, I, I go back to that moment in time and have the experience. Um, for example, in the same botanical garden, there were <laughs> geraniums in rows, um, and, uh, and I was struck by the, the um, not just by the flowers, but by the pots and by the shape of the, uh, the shape of the shelving that they were displayed on. And, and so um, just remember being sort of mesmerized by the symmetry of the, of the image. Well, as you're describing some of the photos you took, what strikes me is that when you take a photograph, it, you have a tendency to look more closely yes. at your environment and to appreciate things you may not normally uh, take time to appreciate. Well, it's, it's, it's as though when you have, um, when you look through the lens of the heart, which is the contemplative center, you see things differently. You can walk past pots of geraniums and not see anything except for pots of geraniums, or you can really see them for what they are. You can see the cracks in the pots. You can see the moss forming on the terracotta. You can see the, the deadheads that need to be removed or the intensity of color from a oh, blue. Is which that is the still pot there. you're referring but those to? Are, those are the images. And, um, so it's the symmetry. I, I like the curve of the stone that they're standing on. Um, I liked the, the just just the the color as I was walking past and the way the light hit the different pots. Um, again, it's it's not a dramatic photograph. I do have some. I mean, my most dramatic photograph I did not bring with me, but it's on the cover of this book, um, Image Guidance and um, and a, a Tool for Spiritual Direction. I don't know if the camera can pick this up. But um, the image on the front of this book is actually of a bubble blower that I caught on the McCormick um, stage at McCormick Place. Um, and I was photographing an event there. And um, you can see the purples and the, and, and the, the iridescence of the bubble. And what was the event going on there? It was um, an event for medical um, pr practitioners. It was an educational event. And this was their entertainment. Okay. So this was not the medical practitioners displaying their medical skills, but rather being entertained um, uh, during an evening event, or it might have been a morning event, I think. But anyway, um, I have a whole series of this bubble blower, and they are very dramatic. And, um, and in a way, you could say, well, I've caught the contemplative moment, except if I think about how tense I was feeling and, and the rapid succession of uh, snap, 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 trying to capture the image, 
it didn't feel like the contemplative moment of stopping to look and gaze, which is what I look at my contemplative photography as being, that I'm actually having a relationship with my subject. For example, the dog. Um, there is a, an, a, a dog portrait of a, a kind of scraggly looking dog. Um, yeah, you mentioned uh, <laughs> your, your bio talks about being a uh, pet photographer. Yes, yes. Well, this is Cooper. And um, Cooper just has so much soul to him. Um, he has a kind of mournful look to him in a way. I mean, he's, he's, just, he's just got character and uh, the expression on his face is, I just had this incredible bond with Cooper. So I wasn't now, just snapping uh, a shot. Uh, did you go, did you take this picture in a studio? Is this a friend's dog? Is this no, it's not a friend's dog. Um, it was actually um, a client and I went to their apartment to do the shoot. I've done pet shots in studio but I don't like the lighting, and I don't like the way that the dogs have to you know, be controlled, basically. Um, but when a dog is in its own environment, um, he's much more relaxed, or she's much more relaxed. So there's Cooper, and he's, he's actually sitting on a wooden bench against a plain wall. And um, you know, to me, that was an opportunity to really connect with him, not as an object, but as uh, it was almost like this crossing over experience into I discovered what it was like to be Cooper. Now, um, was that picture in black and white? It, um, originally in color, I believe. It's become black and white um, after a process of being altered. Yes, and do you prefer uh, black and white or color depending upon? It depends, it depends. Yeah. Um, Cooper is um, a sort of grayish white dog and um, um, I'm not sure whether I prefer the black or white or the color, quite honestly. Now, uh, what type of camera do you photograph with? Um, I have a Canon Mark, um, 5D Mark II. Um, Is that a digital camera? It's a digital camera. Um, and has your uh, photography changed when you went from you know, film to digital? Absolutely. I went from um, spending a fortune on, on shots, uh, on film, and um, sort of restricting what I took to suddenly discovering I could take multiple images of the same subject from multiple angles and um, didn't have to worry about cost and there's always the delete button so it gave me the room to experiment and you know I, I could take 50 shots of the same subject if I wanted without having to worry about the cost factor. Now uh, I, I know there are cameras where you can just take like a video and then if you just want to capture like one frame one picture you could do that have you ever tried that um, the 5d mark II does take video but mm. I actually use my Canon 7d to shoot video but um, I prefer to take my stills um, from uh, from a reg the regular camera settings basically because of that contemplative connection that I'm really seeing uh, when I, I feel that when I'm in video mode the camera is doing the seeing for me I'm holding it but it takes in what's there. Whereas when I'm doing a still photograph, the subject um, somehow is something that I can then focus on. And so um, take, for example, some of my flower photography. I, I have some flower images perhaps we can look at um, that basically um, with, uh, there's a hydrangea bush. There are some- Oh, there it is. Uh, that's not the hydrangea, it's another one, that's yeah. fine. Uh, with that particular image, um, I really had to look at it very closely, and it's actually a tiny blossom. There's the hydrangea bush. I was walking oh, that's past. Beautiful. Um, it's actually uh, in England. I was there a few weeks ago, coming back from Malta, and was just struck by the hydrangeas against a brick wall, um, and and just stopped and and felt that uh, again I had to somehow capture them. But I, I spent a lot of time just standing there looking at the hydrangeas and taking them from different angles. See, I would like to smell that because I'm sure that smell just magnificent. Well, the whole experience is just heady, yes. quite honestly. Yes. Now, um, you mentioned with Cooper that you turned the color photograph into black and white. Uh, t talk a little bit about post-production. Is that contemplative and reflective when you're um. altering the photograph or enhancing it? It can be. Um, I much prefer taking the images. Sometimes this contemplative feel sets in when 
I know there's a couple or an individual who really wants to look their best and um, with some post-production work I can help them look that way. Now there's a fine line of course I mean, part of me wants to be the plastic surgeon, to, 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 but, and on the other hand, I want to capture the essence of the person, the reality of that person. So I mean, I, you don't want to make them look 30 pounds slimmer? No. I mean, <laughs> I've had requests like that, and I, I obliged one time and then regretted it. I felt, okay, this is somebody wanted um, to be on Match.com and, and wanted a, um, an enhanced portrait, and I obliged, and then felt, you know what, I've helped this person be inauthentic, and I, I had real problems with it afterwards. But if it's a question of you know, somebody wanting to really look their best, um, and it's simply a matter of removing some shadow under the eyes and, and, or perhaps getting stray hairs from out of their face, then um, you know, I have a great sense of satisfaction in delivering a product that the person can really feel um, and pleased what, with. And what uh, computer programs do you do for post-production? Um, at the moment, I've, I've just invested in Photoshop CS6. I had mm -hmm. Photoshop CS2 before that, so there's been a big leap from 2 to 6, and I'm still learning the mechanics of, of, um, of 6. Now, but, uh, why don't you tell your audience, tell our audience where, where you teach at, at, at the college level? Um, I teach at Columbia College at the moment. Um, and I teach classes in spirituality. Uh, one of the classes is Exploring the Goddess. We look at the Divine Feminine. Mm -hmm. um, another class I've ju I'm just starting in the fall is Women and Religion. And then I teach a course on Mystical Consciousness. So those are all courses that I really enjoy. Do you ever take any of the photography classes there? Um, I want to take a course in the CS6 program. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I haven't yet, but um, I, I do want to learn uh, some of the mechanics of CS6 very quickly because uh, there's so much to play with. And um, I'm just getting into video now and um, would like to do and that. Who are the photographers that influenced you? Um, probably my dad more than anyone else, which sounds funny. He's not, he's not a, an official photographer, but um, as a child, uh, we always had cameras around and video and um, cine film, and so the, the latest in technology. And at 92, he's still doing um, videos and putting soundtracks to them. And Was it, this his profession? Or no, is he was in the military, actually. Um, po uh, he trained as a lawyer, and then World War II came along, and he joined the military and stayed. Um, but photography was always his passion, so perhaps he has been a big influence in, in my life. Do, do you think the fact that your father is a World War II veteran has influenced you uh, pursuing a spiritual path? Uh, that's a difficult question. That yeah. really is. Um, the topic of World War II has not come up very much um, you know, around the family table. It's coming up more and more now as my dad's in his 90s. But I would say that growing up in Malta, um, in an environment post-World War, where I saw blitzed buildings and heard the stories, and saw buildings that my family used to own that had been blitzed, and heard about family what, what, people. What do you mean by blitz? We might not oh, know blitzed. that ter I'm sorry. Ter ter term in America. Yes, well, Malta was the most bombed place on the fa face of the earth during World War II. And in fact, it narrowly um, escaped um, being decimated by the Nazis and then uh, actually on August 15th, which is a huge national feast, and, we, and August 15th of course is very close, it's, it's also a religious feast on the island, it's the Feast of um, the Assumption, which is a Marian feast, but on the eve of this great feast, um, a convoy finally limped into the Grand Harbor bringing food and, and oil, and all the other convoys had been bombed, and, no, and so the island was being starved into submission and had only three planes to defend it, Faith, Hope, and Charity biplanes. Mm -hmm. wait, wait, th those were the actual those names? Those were the actual names of the planes, Faith, Hope, and Charity. And um, they managed to hold off uh, the Nazi attack, and the, the, um, the convoy got in. So I certainly grew up in an atmosphere of seeing devastation, um, hearing some stories, but being sheltered a lot from, from, from the war. Uh, from what was being said, but it probably fostered the spiritual in me. Um, but the other, the other thing, the, the, the sheer beauty of the island uh, really did, and just the way of life. Um, for example, as something as simple as a tree. Um, you know, my, my parents' house is 500 years old, 
And if I walked is that, down... It's been in the, how long has the house been in the family? Only since the end of the war. My, my grandfather purchased it and then converted it from a farmhouse into a house. But this tree um, is it's about half a mile from my parents' house. And as a child, I used to walk down there, down the lane, to that tree and climb it. And I would spend hours in that tree. Um, and I've just spent hours observing. And, and, and that tree, too, is probably about 500 years old. Um, I was surrounded by antiquity, surrounded by beauty. Um, I would hear the carts going to market being drawn by horses and look out of my window at four in the morning and see the little lanterns under the horses and carts as they went to market. And when you, they, they would pick up goods and to deliver to the houses in the store? They would be going to market with, with produce mostly. And, um, and so I would see them heading for market. Oh, far farmers. Farmers, yes. Yeah, so farmers. you grew up in like a farming community? Uh, I grew up in a, what, what I suppose was a mansion surrounded by several villages. Mm -hmm. And that was part of my childhood experience of being very isolated because I didn't have playmates. We had a um, you know, very privileged lifestyle. And um, when I was old enough, I was sent off to boarding school, but I didn't have playmates, really, as a child. So the inner world and the outer world were two places where I, I found companionship. I spent a lot of time drawing, reading, uh, writing, imagining. So you didn't mind spending time alone? I probably was quite lonely but didn't know it. Mm -hmm. But I sought, I sought refuge in the inner world. And so the inner world became a place I was very comfortable with. And I think perhaps as a very small child, I was quite spiritually and religiously precocious to the point that by the time I was seven, I developed my own theology very clearly and was able to challenge my teachers and all kinds of um, things. Uh, I know you do this for a living, but you want to share your theology uh, and, and how it's expressed in your photography. Well, um, I have a very heart-centered theology. Um, I find dogma and doctrines and things which separate people one from another to be um, heretical, quite honestly. I feel that theology should bring people together rather than separate them. And so the theology I was introduced to in the school I, I went to basically claimed that um, only Catholics would make it to heaven. They were the only ones to make it on the Ark of Salvation, Noah's Ark, of course. And I had an, I had an Episcopalian or Anglican grandfather and a, and a great aunt who basically, um, her, her religion was looking out the window at, 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 the, at Wiltshire Plains, very near Salisbury. Um, and so I began to say to myself, well, if God is the way they're telling me, then that God is not worth believing in. I was seven years old when I could articulate this. And so I began to find a God that I found in nature, a God of intimacy, a God of inclusivity. And so um, I'm, to, to this day, I'm very much into interreligious dialogue. Um, I've, I've been very active with the Parliament your of the World students, Your students must love you. They do. They do. Because you're, you're, you're very liberating and non-dogmatic. You want people to find their own answers, their own uh, truth, their, their own spirit. And that's what I aim for, basically, that I, I want to include everyone. I have my own you know, uh, tradition that I still stay true to, but, with, but on my own terms. You know, so, so very much on my terms rather than being dictated. Did, did you ever meet Dr. Wayne Teasdale? Uh, we were good friends. Yeah. And in fact, I was hired at Columbia when he became terminally ill. And, well, I, I interviewed Dr. Teasdale a couple times and, you know, a great spirit. You, you reminded me, you remind me of him. Well, that's an honor to hear that because you, I, I think of him very highly. And for the audience who doesn't know, uh, Wayne uh, was a Catholic priest. Um, well, we got f uh, five minutes to go. Um, are, are you teaching a class at Infinity? I am on photography. Uh, so I'm wondering if you could just look at some of the other images that um, if perhaps they could just be displayed while we finish sure. our conversation. Sure. Uh, what, what image would you like? The lace maker. The lace maker would be a good one. And, and then there's a wedding shot because we did, and, and the motorcycle. I have to show you the motorcycle. Okay. Um, so perhaps in that order. Well, the wedding shot. Um, that's just um, a couple um, in a relaxed setting against a very old building, basically. And so um, I tried to capture a shot that was not too rigidly posed, but, but captured the intimacy of, of, of their um, affection for one another and, and their bonding. 
And so with that particular image, um, well, that's he, my he seems kind. to be very masculine, and she's very feminine. And they it's, are. They, they, they balance. Now, did they hire, hire you? Um, actually, that is my ne my nephew. Oh, okay. And I went to Malta last year to do the wedding for them. And, and so I had great fun doing that. And because I knew them, then I could sort of enter into that moment a little bit more fully. Do you, do you ever uh, photograph babies? I have done some, yes. That, yes. that must and be that, real, I love real, doing that. Yeah. But again, you need hours. You, you, I mean, that's very contemplative. You can't, you can't rush a baby shot. OK. Um, what, what's the next shot? You the, lace, the lace maker. And um, this particular image, um, I was on the island of Gozo near Malta. It's, it's one of the Maltese islands. Walking past the doorway, so I'm looking through a doorway, and there is. And this so that's woman. what the black is. Yes. The doorway? As I'm actually looking into her home, and there she is sitting near the door, making lace, and she just had this very aged, weathered face, and hands that were obviously old hands, and and so. And, but very skilled. But uh, very skilled with the with, with the with the with the bobbins and the lace, and and so um, from from here the shot looks a little. Um, too illumined, but in, in, a, in a darker format, you can see you can see um, you know the the weathering and and she herself is so contemplative. And where uh, she, yeah, it's like meditation, exactly. extreme state of exactly. focus and concentration. Exactly. What country was that photo? Uh, well, Malt the Maltese Islands. Of course, I'm from Malta, but the island of Gozo, which is off Malta. Mm -hmm. And so uh, um, both Malta and Gozo are famous for their lace. And what are you going to be teaching in, in your class? For infinity, how yes. to see, how to see with the heart, how, okay. to do, how to see something as simple as a motorcycle, if we can look at them, or the motor scooter. <laughs> That's um, uh, basically, it's a, r a bright red motor scooter or motorcycle um, against sand. And the brightness of that, I mean, I'm not into motor scooters, motorcycles, um, but the it, in, in a way, it reminds me of that famous red wheelbarrow uh, that one poet talks about, the, 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 the brightness of a red wheelbarrow. And here's the, the brightness of a, a motorcycle and against sand and, and just the, the contrast. So to see the, the beautiful, even in something mechanical, you mm -hmm. know, it doesn't have to be a beautiful flower. And then once you capture that in a picture, you start to see it in your everyday, ordinary life. Everywhere you go, whether it's the sidewalk where you're seeing a, a weeds coming up between the, the, uh, the, the paving stones, or whether it's looking at the oil slick on water. There's one more image of fishing boats, perhaps we could well, look at. Well, we've, we've got less than a minute if we can get that fishing boat up there real quick. And what's important with this is... That almost looks like a painting. Those are, those are two boats sort of adjusting each other. It's the water that really interests me. The, the reflection in the water and the oil on the water surface. And we're Malta again? Again, yeah. again. That, that's my sacred landscape. I mean, any landscape is sacred, but for me, um, most of my very special images come from there. Yeah, and so I assume those are very uh, practical boats, they fishermen that use those boats to make a living? They, yes, they're practical, but they're also very ornate, and they all have eyes to keep off the evil eye. So there's, there's so a level spirituality. of spirituality. Oh, absolutely! It's the eye of Horus, but it's supposed to keep away the evil eye. Is there like a guardian of fishermen? Um, there must be a saint, um, probably Santa Maria. Actually, I would think um, Stella Maris. <laughs> All right, got to wrap it up. Uh, for more information about InterQuest Infinity Foundation or uh, Dr. Elizabeth Ann Stewart, stay tuned until the credits at, at the end. Until next time, wish you good health, good spirits, and good fortune. Thank, Thank you, you, Dr. So Stewart. Thank you so much, Thank you. Thank you. Foundation.org or call us at 847-831-8828.